North Carolina, 15 electoral votes. Minnesota with 10. So Iowa, all three of us ladies have donned our pantsuits in honor of this historical day. <laughs> Let me see. The kids have the on pantsuits. The girls are in pantsuits, too. <laughs> Apparently. I can't really tell in the picture, but they must be. Really, there's, there's so much joy in this. I know. It's got to turn out right. I'm here with Senator Joyce Elliott, who was a delegate for Hillary Clinton at the Democratic National Convention. What's tonight been like so far? I just can't wait until the final count is in and she is the president. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. I don't want to be reminded of these horrible medicine. moments. Something is happening. <laughs> I was dressed in white to go with the vote to honor the breaking of the, of the glass ceiling. Because you know when that ceiling breaks, it's going to look all white when it falls down. <laughs> I tell you, Ginger, I love this woman. The first wave feminist movement at the turn of the 20th century is a time when women fought for things we now take for granted, like owning property in our own name and women's suffrage. I like thinking my grandmother was among the many women dressed in white, marching in solidarity. With the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, women were granted the right to vote. My 23-year-old Mima would now add voting to her job of wife, mother of three children, getting meals on the table, and eventually becoming my grandmother. That's Mima in the 1950s when I was growing up in middle class Arkansas, a time when home movies captured me wearing my Easter bonnet or celebrating Christmas surrounded by generations of parents, siblings, aunts, uncles, and cousins. It was a time when a night out for my parents was a home party with friends making their own music and dancing to it. I was among the first generation of children to grow up with television, sitting cross-legged in front of our favorite programs such as the iconic Howdy Doody. During a visit to the Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site, I remembered my seven-year-old self when President Eisenhower broke into my afternoon television ritual to announce that he was sending soldiers into nearby Little Rock the capital of my state. Disorderly mobs have deliberately prevented the carrying out of proper orders from a federal court. I didn't understand why the soldiers had to protect the Negro students, just as I didn't understand why the white people were yelling and throwing things at them, just because they wanted to go to Central High School. But I did understand that it was wrong. I never did attend integrated schools, and other than the women my mother hired to clean the house, I didn't know any people of color. As I grew up, the social injustice of my childhood would sweep me along with other girls across the country, such as Nancy, Christine, and Joyce, into the second wave feminist movement. When we, like my grandmother, would have the opportunity to break down barriers to social justice. It takes more of me than I ever thought I had to trust to just be who I am. I had been kind of the leader in my, in my elementary school, my class. People looked to me that way and I'd been president of every little club we had. And then we got to the age where they were choosing the crossing guard. A child from the school would go out and wore one of these belts with a little badge on it, and they would stand like this, and the children would cross, and it was a very, it seemed like a very, very responsible and important job. So, of course, I wanted to have that job. And the principal said, well, I'm sorry, Nancy, but um, only boys can be crossing guards. And I said, why? If everyone in the school thinks I'm the most responsible third grader and I can't be a, a crossing guard and I'm even tall, there's something wrong there. I went to school here in Arkansas. Uh, and because of the times, the schools were segregated. And so I went to a segregated school all the way through the ninth grade. 
but that was also the time that um, I really became very aware of the inequalities of where I lived. We had to ride the bus for almost two hours to get to school. And there was a school that was an all white school that was uh, maybe three or four minutes from my home. Um, and we were not allowed, allowed to ride that bus and go to that school. And there had been lawsuit after lawsuit trying to run our schools according to the Brown decision. What was decided was the black kids would be split up and we would be forced to go to these other four schools. So my family and about four or five others were forced to go to Willisville School District. And we were told, you have been here long enough at the end of the year, you may go back to your all black school. And in fact, we expect you to do so. I remember being so angry about that because that had turned my life upside down at that point. Because the only way I was going to get to go to college, I, I, I knew at that time, was if I did really, really well in school and, I, and was the valedictorian of my school. But that had been upset when we were forced to move from the school. And that never, I never kind of got over that in my head. You've messed up my whole life, my whole career.